Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We will get started in just a second. Um, we're letting some more people into the room. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining and happy May Hepatitis Awareness Month. We are really excited to share um, a very uh, interesting topic with everyone today um, in recognition of Hepatitis Awareness Month. Uh, my name is Kate Morars. I am the Deputy Director of Public Health at the Hepatitis B Foundation and Director of Hepi United. So today we're gonna to be talking about um, a program called Hepi Moms, um, about the prevention of perinatal hepatitis B transmission and management of hepatitis B during pregnancy and postpartum. Um, and just to go over a few housekeeping items on ways that you can participate in the webinar today, uh, a note to, that everyone is on mute. Um, and uh, if you would like to say hello um, to colleagues in the chat box, please feel free to uh, to say hi and share your name and organization, your location. And then if you have any questions, uh, please share questions um, during the presentations or afterwards in the question window. Um, and please be sure to type them into the question window so that we can keep track of the questions and they don't get lost in the chat window. And finally, the session is being recorded and we'll be sure to share a copy of the recording and the presentation slides after the webinar. Great. Right. Um, so today's webinar is being presented by HEPI United as part of our training and technical assistance series. Uh, HEPI United is a national coalition of over 50 national organizations and local community coalitions in 30 cities and 24 states, including Washington, D.C. Uh, we are dedicated to reducing the health disparities and inequities associated with hepatitis B by increasing awareness, screening, vaccination, and linkage, linkage to care for highly impacted communities across the United States. And if you would like more information about Helping United, please uh, feel free to reach out. And if you're interested in joining, we would love to, to add you to the map. All right, and we're excited to welcome Dr. Amy Tang, who is the Director of, um, of Immigrant Health at Northeast Medical Services. Um, Dr. Sorry, let me just pull up Dr. Tang's um, bio um, so that I can do her justice. Dr. Tang is a primary care internist, um, and NEMS Northeast Medical Services is in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she oversees NEMS hepatitis B and tuberculosis elimination programs. She is the clinical prin principal investigator for the CDC TB Epi Epidemiological Studies Consortium at NEMS, uh, and this is in collaboration with the University of California, San Francisco, uh, California Department of Public Health, and the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Um, and the goal of that is to develop cost-effective strategies for increasing TB testing and treatment in the primary care setting. Dr. Tang has also served as the co-chair of the National Task Force on Hepatitis B between 2017 and 2019. And with that, I am going to go ahead and uh, let Dr. Tang um, begin with her presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining during your lunch or your afternoon um, to listen to this uh, topic of um, hepatitis B and, um, and pregnant women. Uh, I have been working in the Community Health Center uh, now for about six years, so currently in the San Francisco Bay Area and previously in New York City, and um, will be drawing upon my experience uh, creating Happy Moms programs um, in the community health setting for um, high-risk populations. Uh, Kate, did you give me control? Oh, there we go. I am clicking, oh, okay. Um, so in order to make this talk as engaging as possible, I've actually built in about five uh, poll questions um, for you to be thinking about as we go along. 
Um, and the first question that I wanted to ask uh, the group uh, that you can respond to the poll is, uh, what is the mode of transmission um, that's primarily responsible for the ma majority of chronic Hep B infections worldwide? Just give you a couple more seconds to vote, and then we'll go ahead and see the summary of your responses. Okay, and um, as appropriate and the topic that we're talking about, um, the primary uh, mode of transmission is from mother to child during childbirth, and that's what we're talking about today. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, now the next question is, Hepatitis B infection during infancy is associated with what percentage chance of developing chronic Hep B infection? So if an infant is exposed to Hep B, what is the likelihood that that infection will turn into a chronic infection as opposed to an acute and resolved infection? Couple more seconds and then we'll see the summary. And the audience um, answered uh, correctly, so 90%. So it's a very high likelihood if an infant is exposed to Hep B of turning into a chronic infection as opposed to an adult um, getting exposed to Hep B. If they have, um, if they're immunocompetent, have a normal immune system, their likelihood is 10% as adults, but for infants, it's 90%. Um, and I just want everyone to think about the implications of chronic infection means that about 25% um, of those individuals, if untreated or unmonitored, will develop some form of liver, uh, liver complication, like liver cancer or liver failure or cirrhosis. Next slide. Um, now, all of this is to really um, come together with the goal that um, as healthcare providers or public health providers who are listening to this talk today, um, that we uh, all have a role in preventing new Hep B infections for future generations um, through comprehensive perinatal management of women um, with hepatitis B and their infants. Next slide. Um, now the objective today, I kind of broke up into different sort of um, different disciplines, but it's not always so clear cut. But for the uh, for persons who work with pregnant women in obstetrics fields, um, one of the goals is that we make sure we're checking the Hep B surface antigen in all women who are pregnant um, during every single pregnancy, and that we link them to care if they're positive. For those working in adult medicine. Um, that for those women who are identified um, as needing treatment during pregnancy, that we know how to evaluate them appropriately and how to safely start and stop medication so that we can decrease Hep B transmission to their um, infants and also um, engage them in long-term monitoring for this chronic condition. On the pediatric side, um, we, we want to ensure that all infants that are born to hepatitis B positive women receive um, all of the appropriate vaccinations. So not just for those in the complete series of Hep B vaccine, but also um, Hep B immune globulin, which I'll talk about later, and that they get follow-up testing um, close to a year old to ensure that they are immune to Hep B and did not, um, did not get infected with Hep B from, uh, from childbirth. And then for really for everyone, especially those in public health, um, the importance of asking about family history of hepatitis B and liver cancer and uh, recommending that all household contacts um, with an unknown Hep B status get tested and vaccinated if they're susceptible. Uh, next slide. Um, we do have this uh, perinatal Hep B management workflow diagram 
uh, published on a what, what we call the primary care hepatitis B guidelines or guidance document. Um, it's on the University of Washington's Hepatitis B Online, so I put the link here. I'll also mention it at the end again. Um, that guidance document is a simplified guidance for really frontline providers who are caring for patients with hepatitis B. We have a specific page here that you see here that's focused on how to manage pregnant women uh, you know, during pregnancy and after, and I'll be going over all these points. But here's really just a one-page summary if you wanted to um, have that uh, accessible on your desktop or at your, in your office. Um, but the key here is really to identify and evaluate pregnant women with hepatitis B and ensure proper vaccination of their infants to reduce mother-to-child transmission. Uh, the, the most recent updates regarding perinatal hep B management were published in 2018. Um, so before the uh, birth dose, the recommended birth dose uh, hep B vaccine for all infants was kind of more of a soft recommendation. There were a lot, in practice, there were a lot of uh, families who were electing to get their first dose as in the outpatient setting instead of in the hospital. Um, but in 2018, uh, the CDC and ACIP made a uh, very strong recommendation that all infants get vaccinated in the hospital um, rather than allowing for this opt-out system. Um, we also had updated guidance uh, from AASLD, so the American Association for Study of Liver Diseases, um, with their updated recommendations on managing pregnant women um, uh, with hepatitis B and making sure that they have a DNA checked um, in the second trimester and putting patients on treatment if they reach a certain um, hep B viral load threshold. So we'll go over that in more detail in the subsequent slides. But these are the main two uh, key recommendations from the CDC and the, the liver specialist uh, organizations that we follow. Next slide. So um, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, the CDC, and the ASLD all recommend that all pregnant women get tested for hepatitis B at every pregnancy, and um, ideally in the first trimester when they get their routine prenatal labs. And I want to stress here that we recommend testing um, even if they had a prior test in a prior pregnancy. Um, it, and this, so this is not risk-based testing. We're talking about... Um, all pregnant women. And um, the reason why we re recommend retesting regardless of prior result is that there are some women who may have been surface antigen negative before, but they were actually susceptible to hep B, never got vaccinated, and then got infected, and it was not made, they didn't have symptoms at the time. Now, the opposite can also be true where you have a woman who was previously positive on their surface antigen, and then they cleared their um, surface antigen and became negative at a subsequent pregnancy. And so then their infants no longer need the hep B um, immune globulin. So both cases do happen, and that's why we check every single time. Uh, this is the official CDC um, flowchart. So it looks a little different from the one I published, I think, which has more detail on the treatment piece, but it's just really summarizing here. Um, the arm, especially about vaccination. So if a, if a patient is negative for surface antigen, um, we see if they have any risk factors for hepatitis B, like having um, a sex partner, actually multiple sex partners, um, having a, a partner with known hep B, surface antigen positivity, um, clinically having abnormal labs that suggest hepatitis or history of STDs and injection drug, um, drug use. So these risk factors would actually um, allow for us to recommend that they should actually get vaccinated during pregnancy. Um, and just keep in mind that right now, the three-dose hep B vaccines like Endurix and Recombivax are the ones that are recommended during pregnancy. Um, a lot of us may be using Heplisav, um, frequently the two-dose that's given over one month, um, and that is a really great vaccine. It does increase um, vaccine completion. However, it's not currently... Um, recommended for pregnant women. It's still being studied. Uh, 
Um, now, if somebody if somebody doesn't have these risk factors, then they can also elect to be uh, vaccinated after pregnancy. Um, but there isn't any harm for the uh, woman to be vaccinated during pregnancy. So another poll question, why are infants born to hepatitis uh, B surface antigen negative women recommended to get the Hep B vaccine within 24 hours of birth. So why do we give birth dose to all infants regardless of the mom status? Give a couple more seconds and then we'll see the summary. Great. Um, yes, the correct answer is all of the above. Um, now I'll just go over each one one by one. So one of the reasons is that we want to protect infants from transmission from a caregiver or household member. Um, so the mom may not have Hep B, but potentially the uh, father of the child, or let's say the grandmother um, or the nanny um, may have hepatitis B, and that is not known um, during pregnancy. And so it's pr to protect the infant during that period where they're not yet vaccinated for Hep B from getting infected. Um, now, there have been lots of case reports, even though birth dose was recommended really a long time ago, that hospitals um, often mix up the, or sometimes mi mix up the hepatitis B surface antigen and surface antibody results because the way that the labs are abbreviated, um, they can look a little bit similar. And so a woman may be surface antigen positive and surface antibody negative, but they kind of flip it and they misread it. So hep B serologies can be confusing for a lot of people, even medical providers. And um, because this has resulted in mix ups, that's another reason. Um, why we offer birth dose. So in case the mom actually does have a Hep B, but it was misidentified. And so at least just getting the birth dose offers some level of protection for the baby. And lastly, there are also some women who don't get tested for Hep B during pregnancy for one reason or another. Maybe they presented late to care um, or their results were not properly faxed or reported to the hospital. That also happens. Um, and so it's also to protect um, in that situation. Um, another question, um, besides hepatitis B vaccine birth dose, what else uh, is given specifically to infants that are born to mothers with known Hep B within 12 hours of birth? Oh, looks. a couple more seconds and then we can see the summary. Great. Um, so I think I may have mentioned this already before, um, but for the infants born to HEPI moms, we give the HEPI immune globulin. Um, so uh, the birth dose alone, as I mentioned in the prior slide, does uh, provide some protection against mother to child transmission. So about 75% protection. Now, when they get HBIG, um, which is the Hep B immune globulin, it actually increases that protection to 94%. Uh, Post-vaccination serology testing. So this is regarding who. Uh, this is regarding the blood test that is done after a vaccine series is completed, and this is recommended for infants who are born to Hep B moms. Um, also for infants whose mother's Hep B status just remains unknown indefinitely. For example, if an infant is, um, is surrendered shortly after birth. Um, we recommend doing this testing between 9 to 12 months of age, um, which is typically um, when 
most infants have completed their vaccine series, but technically it has to be at least one month after their last dose of the series. Um, and that is because we want to avoid detecting the surface antigen after, uh, from, the, from simply getting the vaccine. Um, we do not perform um, the test earlier than nine months also to avoid detection of the antibody uh, being, like, I guess, falsely positive from getting Hbig, the hepi immune globulin. Um, and then lastly, the PVST. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of messaging about uh, screening for hepatitis B with all three tests these days, so surface antigen, surface antibody, and core antibody. And that applies to almost every situation except for um, these infants who get their testing um, between 9 to 12 months from having a, a hepi positive mom. For these infants, we only do the two tests, surface antigen and surface antibody. And that is because the core antibody can sometimes be falsely positive from passively acquired uh, maternal um, core antibody up to two years of age. So for these infants born hepi moms, you don't want to check the core until after uh, two years of age, if you need to, although you, in most cases you wouldn't need to recheck them if they're um, if their initial surface antigen and surface antibody were satisfactory. Now, interpreti interpreting these results. So if their surface antigen is negative, that is great. They were not infected with hepatitis B. Then we also look at the surface antibody. Now, if that's greater than 10 on a quantitative or if you get a qualitative and it's positive, then the patient is protected for hepatitis B, and we say presumably for life. So they do not need any further monitoring and management for hep B. Um, they, they do not need to be rechecked um, later on in life to ensure that their um, antibodies are still high because we do sometimes see something called waning antibody immunity, or waning, waning antibody titers, um, which is uh, not uncommon in a lot of other diseases or uh, vac vaccinations, but um, it's because they haven't been exposed to it in a while, and so their an their antibody levels will decrease. But because we have evidence that they did respond to it initially, they do not need boosters in the future. Now, if their PVST is initially less than 10 or negative, then we do want to um, give them additional vaccine. And so they can either complete a whole second series, which is like a whole nother three doses, and then retest one to two months after the last dose. There's also this alternative uh, option that was offered in that CDC MMWR update in 2018, which is to do just one additional, like one booster, so one additional vaccine, and then do the PVST one to two months after that. And if that is now positive, there's nothing more to do. But if it's still negative, the antibody, then you would finish the series and give two more doses and then recheck again to verify that they responded. Um, there are some people who just don't respond to the three dose, and so when they get older, they could potentially get the um, Heplosav version. Now, for those who are um, service engine positive between 9 to 12 months, um, unfortunately, that means that they will likely have chronic infection and they should be referred to a, hepat a pediatric um, gastroenterologist or hepatologist for further follow-up and evaluation. Next slide. Now, hepatitis B immunoprophylaxis failure. So this is really the, the case where, you know, the infant did receive their birth dose and their hep B immune globulin, but the, they still tested positive for surface antigen, and that means those vaccines alone failed to, uh, to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Now, this does happen in 8 to 32% of infants that are born with moms who have high virus levels. So there are some parts of the world where infants are receiving birth dose in HBIG, but the moms aren't being monitored for their hep B during pregnancy, so it's unknown if they had a high viral load or not. But this is really the precise reason why the CDC and ASLD recommends that moms get viral load testing during pregnancy, because there are some women who may need to be on treatment to further prevent the risk of spread. Um, now, here's a poll question. 
Um, so pregnant women with a hep B DNA level greater than what, uh, what number, um, how many IU per mil, um, are recommended hep B antiviral treatment to prevent transmission to their infants. So what is the viral load cutoff that we use to decide if a mother needs antiviral to prevent uh, transmission to her infant? I'll let you answer that poll question. Okay, maybe, I think maybe the poll question is not working. Um, so you can answer in the chat box if you would like, but uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So the answer is C, as most of you have already responded. Um, there was a large uh, retrospective study in 2012 looking at about 900 uh, Chinese mother to infant pairs uh, where immunoprophylaxis failure occurred. And they noticed that the hep B DNA level uh, was as low as 10 to the 6 copies per mil, which is about 200,000 IU per mil. Th there are two different uh, units that we can report DNA levels. So you can either do copies or um, international units. So these days, we typically use international units, and that's why we've listed this 200,000 cutoff. And that's why the CDC and the ASLD has recommended that women who have viral load greater than 200,000 should initiate antiviral treatment um, approximately 10 weeks before their due date, which is like 28 to 32 weeks of pregnancy to decrease um, the hep B antiviral, uh, DNA levels before delivery. You know, some of this really depends on what exact number they're starting off at. So if they're, you know, greater than a million um, IU per mil uh, DNA level, very high, those women may need more time to come down versus those who are just at 200,000. So um, if you have women who have a very, very high viral load, they're antigen positive, and um, you may want to start a little bit earlier. And then another factor is um, I've also managed some uh, multiplet uh, pregnancies, so women who are having twins or triplets who maybe are anticipated to deliver earlier than 40 weeks. And so you really want to allow for 10 weeks, approximately 10 weeks, to bring down their viral load. Um, before their estimated due date. Next slide. Um, this is a study that I did while I was at uh, Charles B. Wong Community Health Center um, in New York City, where there is a very high prevalence of uh, women who are pregnant with hepatitis B. And we found that one in five uh, pregnancies among Asian American women with chronic hep B were considered this high risk um, for mother to child transmission. So meaning that they met this viral load cutoff of 200,000. So it's really not uncommon and a really big reason why we really need to check all women with chronic hep B, what their viral load is, because you know, in high-risk settings, maybe about 20% of them will need to be on antiviral. Um, for that study, we looked at about 1,000 women, uh, mostly born in China, um, who had chronic hep B and were getting their prenatal, um, health at our, uh, prenatal care at our community health center um, over a 10-year period. And um, while most of these women were what we call hep E antigen positive, so in the infectivity and replication state, there's also 7% who are antigen negative. So I think prior recommendations for starting antiviral treatment were also based off of E antigen status, but because there are also people who are antigen negative who may have viral mutations that increase their viral load, we go mainly by the viral load and not their e antigen status. Um, now, indications to um, pr uh, prescribe antiviral treatment, I mentioned already the 200,000, and what, what would you start? So, uh, Viriad or tenofovir di uh, disopropyl fumarate is the uh, preferred medication for uh, pregnant women. We used to use these pregnancy categories, which we no longer use, but it's pregnancy category B formally, um, as opposed to C or D for some of the, I think, um, I think Entecavir is C, and I'm not sure. I don't think that uh, TAF or Vemlody has a designation because it was released after they stopped using the pregnancy categories. Um, but 
it is recommended because it is efficacious in reducing viral load and it also has a decreased likelihood of resistance. Um, as I mentioned before, starting it at least 10 weeks prior to delivery, and that may depend on how many um, uh, infants there uh, or how many babies they are carrying. And um, really, the reason for starting antiviral medication in this case is really solely to prevent vertical transmission. And in most of these cases, the, the mother can actually just stop the antiviral at birth um, after the baby has been born. And when treatment is discontinued, um, there is this risk for post-treatment flare uh, where once they stop the medicine, because they previously had high viral load, it will shoot up. That is a certainty. Um, but whether that is also associated with an elevation in their liver enzymes, um, that can occur with a lot of women. And we want to monitor for that. And if it goes above a certain amount, some women may need to restart medicine. But the majority of women do not need to restart, and they just need monitoring. Um, so at the minimum, they should be monitored every three months for six months from stopping the medicine, although um, I think in practice a lot of um, providers will often do um, one month. Ooh, I think I clicked something on accident. I'll try to go back to... Um, so here's a slide on post-treatment and postpartum monitoring. So there's also this idea that in postpartum period, hepatitis flare, even in women without chronic hepatitis B, you just women without liver disease, they can get an increase in their ALT. Um, but especially for women with chronic hep B and those who recently stopped treatment, it, it can happen. Um, so this is where I mentioned you can do one month, three months, and six months, but at the minimum, three months and six months. And depending on if those labs are elevated, you may need to do it more frequently. Um, so if the ALT is increased more than 100, uh, then we also want to check some other labs like the direct bilirubin, INR platelets, those liver function tests, um, and AST to see if there is any uh, concern for more severe liver decompensation. And the general rule is that you start antiviral if they are um, more than 10 times the upper limit of normal, which for women is 25, so that would be if they're greater than 250, they go back on meds. But if they're not at that point yet, you can just continue to monitor very closely. And most women will come back down. So I've had some women who maybe ALT went up to 90, um, but then it went down after that and we didn't need to restart medication. Uh, so this next slide is just to really um, remind you that there are some women who need to be on long-term treatment, so not just for the pregnancy period, but long-term treatment because they have evidence of what I call immune active chronic hepatitis B. So this is like a simplified algorithm of how I think about, in general, non-pregnant patients who, and pregnant patients who should be on antiviral. So if they have cirrhosis, which we evaluate using um, fibrosis assessments like FibroScan or FibroSure or even simply calculating a FIB4 um, score, then all of anyone with, with cirrhosis should be put on treatment at the time of diagnosis with cirrhosis. If they don't have cirrhosis, which will be the majority of pregnant women, then we go by this uh, cutoff of 2,000. So I mentioned previously a cutoff of 200,000 for um, putting women on treatment to reduce mother-to-child transmission. But when we're talking about immune active hep B, we look at both DNA levels and ALT, and as I mentioned, their fibrosis score. Now, if they have a DNA level that's less than 2,000, um, you don't need to put them on treatment during pregnancy. But if it's greater than 2,000 and they have an elevated ALT, then you'll need to monitor and try to figure out if they'll need to be on treatment. So if you want to prescribe, if you don't feel comfortable and you don't typically manage hep B in your practice, at this point they could be referred to a liver special, a hep B uh, specialist um, to decide if they should be put on treatment earlier or if they can just get close monitoring. Um, but pa patients who are put on treatment for this reason, for immune active, chronic hep B should just continue treatment throughout pregnancy and postpartum period for long-term uh, treatment and uh, de decreasing their long-term risk of liver complications like liver cancer and cirrhosis. Next slide. 
Um, that uh, primary care HEPI management document that I mentioned before um, has this section on um, treatment endpoints and how do you assess for treatment response. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about that here, but just know that you, if you do start treatment, that we do have some guidance on um, which persons can stop treatment and who should just continue indefinitely. Now, hepatitis B and breastfeeding. So uh, this is a really common question that comes up. Um, let's say that you have a woman who is surface antigen positive but does not need to be on antiviral medication. So uh, the messaging to them is to say that there's no evidence that hepatitis B can tra be transmitted uh, via breast milk, and breastfeeding is very much encouraged um, if they are able. And um, that, yeah, they don't need to worry about transmitting from breast milk. We, of course, know that hep B is transmitted through blood, so there, some people bring up this concern, well, you know, it's not uncommon for breastfeeding women to develop cracked or bleeding nipples from breastfeeding and what to do in that case. So theoretically, the post-exposure prophylaxis, the uh, hepi immunoglobulin that's given at birth, can provide um, up to like six months of protection from future exposures with hep B, for example, through the blood of cracked nipple. Um, and then once they finish completing or complete their series of hep B vaccination, that would offer them um, sort of continued protection. So if that happens, mo mothers can, um, you know, should do proper nipple, nipple care and, you know, follow up with their pediatrician OBGYN about whether to continue breastfeeding or to kind of hold off and pump, for example. Um, but um, it theoretically is safe because they did get an extra vaccine that uh, protects from future exposures. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about for women who, uh, who do need to continue their antiviral medication long term for um, immune active chronic hep B, um, there are actually no adverse uh, effects linked to infants who are breastfed while the mother was on antiviral therapy, um, but providers can um, consider, uh, well, this is actually more for the uh, women who go on it for the 200,000 cutoff. Um, the reason why we tell them to stop at birth is because of this theoretical exposure to the antiviral, even though that there haven't been any um, adverse effects re reported to infants. So I do recommend for women who need to be on it long term that they do continue and just to try to give them reassurance that it's um, there have been no issues reported um, for the infant. Now, the, the next few slides are just going to go over uh, how when we develop Hep B Moms programs in the community health setting or other medical settings, what are really key components um, that we need to think about. And for those of you who are listening and who are thinking about establishing a program like a Happy Moms program. So really the first, I think, key component is having a Happy care manager, a designated care manager who provides perinatal Happy education, who coordinates the household contact screening for all of the Happy Moms in that facility. Um, as I mentioned before, this is really a collaboration between adult medicine, OBGYN, and pediatrics departments, and also local hospitals where the infants are delivered. Um, we want to make sure that all the moms with HEPI are linked to care with a HEPI specialist, whether that's uh, a hepatologist or gastroenterologist, or in the case of our community health centers, we actually have trained um, provider HEPI champions to um, be able to manage these women with HEPI and those who need antiviral medication. Um, you, will, you would also need to have um, e uh, electronic health uh, record tracking or reporting that allows the care manager to um, in real time see who are the pregnant patients with Hep B, making sure that all those individuals are linked to care and that they have gotten their labs done and that those who are at highest risk are started on antiviral. So we have um, a report that is generated that has been built and is generated anytime we kind of request it so we can um, track new women who become pregnant and are identified with Hep B and also to make sure we're tracking the infants after um, they're born and that they complete their vaccine series in PBST. Um, so our NEMS Happy Moms program, um, I just put an example of our structure here. So we provide perinatal happy education and care coordination 
through our care manager, um, who also oversees household contacts testing for Hep B, which I do want to mention is really not an easy task. We've noticed that when we talk to moms about getting their partners or other household members tested, there's often a lot of reluctance to have that discussion with their family members about their Hep B status. Sometimes it seems like it maybe hasn't even been disclosed to them before or they just don't want to bring it up. And so even though I've mentioned this in several slides, it's actually not an easy task in practice. And um, we do have um, the luxury at our health center that oftentimes the spouse receives care at our health center and we're able to look up to just ensure that they were tested and uh, what was their status and that they got vaccinated if they were susceptible. But um, there are maybe other settings where it may be harder to find out the status of other members of the family. Um, also, we make sure that all of the um, pregnant women are linked to care with a provider before and after pregnancy um, and that they're treated if needed uh, to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Um, we do a lot of training for our um, NEMS providers and particularly the provider champions to be able to feel confident um, because this is not necessarily something that's taught in their training. And lastly, we ensure that the Infants who are born happy moms receive timely immunoprophylaxis, that their results are communicated to the hospital. Um, our pediatricians also round on the new newborn infants, and so they can also ensure that they received their vaccine and that they completed them and that they get their post-vaccination serology test. And on the left side, I've kind of illustrated that we have departmental HEP-B champions, so that's people like myself, and we also have um, departmental champions for OBGYN and pediatrics. And then we also have our provider site champion. So these are the adult medicine providers that have received special training and that we meet um, every two months to talk about um, uh, interesting cases that we've managed and um, you know, updates to our program. And, our, and most importantly, our, um, our care manager um, who does all the education and linkage to care and household contacts testing for our patients. Um, now, all of this is really under the umbrella of our Hep B and C microelimination program at our community health center, which has all these components of screening all adult patients for Hep B and C, vaccinating all Hep B susceptible patients, um, and then, of course, our Hep B moms program is really under the prevention arm. And then mitigation is really regarding our patients who do have chronic Hep B and ensuring that they're getting their routine lab monitoring and liver cancer surveillance for those who are at increased risk that they're getting uh, fibrosis staging through our FibroScan program and treatment. Um, and we do a lot of education continually with our providers and also some advocacy on the local and state and national level. Um, some data on um, why we do all of this. So we have found through our screening that one in three of our adult patients have been infected with Hep B in their lifetime. And what I mean by this is that their core antibody is positive. And so even if they're surface antigen negative, they're still at risk for reactivation or liver complications if they go on immunosuppressive medications. So we do that out that education, even if they're just core positive. Um, we do find that one in 12 of our adult patients have chronic hepatitis B infection. Um, many of them didn't know until they were screened with us, um, or perhaps they knew, but they didn't understand that they needed routine monitoring. Um, what the other health center I worked at before, Charles B. Wong, actually had a prevalence among adults of one in eight. So this uh, prevalence really varies in different health settings. It may be more or less, um, but it's good to know. And um, we, of course, many of you know that one in four um, will um, suffer from liver complications if they're unmonitored or untreated. And so that's really why we have this sort of mitigation program. And lastly, uh, we have received data from our local health department that actually one in four pregnant women with Hep B received care at our community health center. So a pretty significant proportion of women in San Francisco get their prenatal care um, at, at NEMS, especially, or specific, uh, specifically those who have Hep B during pregnancy. So we have close coordination with the health department. So this is a resource that we've created uh, we call it our, um, it's like our Happy Moms road, Roadmap, but we've created this really schematic for what to expect and what to kind of check off um, for both women uh, who are pregnant with Hep B and their infants um, 
to prevent mother-to-child transmission. We have this in um, Chinese and Vietnamese as well. Now, for those who are thinking of creating a program like this, there are some ways to sustain the work. Um, our perinatal uh, HEPI care manager, um, we're able to enroll her as a, a CPSP provider so that all the education that she does um, can be billed um, under Medi-Cal. So Medi-Cal is California's Medicaid program, and they have special services for pregnant women in the uh, peripartum period. And that includes things like health education, nutritional education, psychosocial support. And so under the realm of health education, we've um, enrolled our care manager to be a health education CPSP provider. And so, you know, we're even regardless of current grant funding, we're able to continue this work in the long term. This is a, an EHR template that our care manager and myself uh, worked on very closely with our EHR team um, to include the, you know, state, the stage of their pregnancy, the relevant recent labs that they've had, um, and then some information about um, when they were aware of Hep B, if they've had prior management and treatment before, and then also to document family history and household contact screening, which is very important to this work. Um, also, who's planning to take care of the baby, especially if it's a you know family member, relative, or nanny babysitter that uh, that all of these individuals get Hep B testing um, before the baby's born. Um, and then some uh, educational points that we make sure to talk about during um, during the perinatal education visit, um, and that's all documented in the note, and then billed if the patient has Medi-Cal. So some take-home points, really, that um, comprehensive management of, um, of HEPI mothers really involves coordination between obstetrics, the HEPI provider, the delivery hospital, pediatrics, and local health departments, um, and accurate exchange of information um, amongst all providers is crucial. And so those uh, key objectives I mentioned before about all women getting tested at every pregnancy, that all women um, who need antiviral treatment during pregnancy um, are receive, uh, well, that all women are identified and then um, evaluated if they need uh, antiviral during pregnancy to decrease, further decrease the risk of uh, mother to child transmission, and then that um, infants receive timely vaccines and immunoprophylaxis, and then also their post vaccination serology test, and then finally, that we all ask about family history of Hep B and liver cancer and household contacts testing for individuals who do not have a known Hep B status. Um, my very last slide, I want to just remind you that a great resource that um, I had that I was involved in developing um, is available on Hepatitis B online. And it's this uh, 11 or 10 page document on managing Hepatitis B and uh, with a particular section on perinatal management, which I think really summarizes things very simply on one page. Um, so that's all I have for today, and um, I will respond to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tang. That was a really comprehensive picture of um, providing both like the clinical uh, process as well as a kind of a big picture, how that is played out in a public kind of health intervention. Um, so I'm going to open it up for questions now, and I'm going to just take a look at our Q&A um, to see if we've received any questions. Great. So we do have a question. Um, can you clarify about uh, service antibody if a qualitative result is positive? We ask for a quantitative interpretation of that positive as CDC recommends the values be uh, 10 milliliters or greater. Yeah, I, I think I understand the question. So um, you actually can, if, if, the, if the qualitative result is positive, you can stop there because I, I, I think all labs use the same cutoff of, of 10 uh, milli international units per milliliter um, as a cutoff for positive. So you do not need to go further and ask for the quantitative result. You can just stop at positive. Great, thank you. 
Um, another, another question I see here in the chat is, um, any recommendations on how to get providers, both pediatricians and OBs, to be more cooperative with the local health department in managing um, the prevention of perinatal transmission? Okay, yeah, so I know there are a lot of perinatal programs um, in major municipalities that have been probably active for 20 plus years. And um, I know there are a lot of uh, requests for labs and faxes and things like that. I think that establishing, probably identifying which health centers or providers are um, often caring for your at-risk patient population. So, you know, when I was in New York and, and now in San Francisco, there often are certain health centers or providers that care for the majority of like immigrant patients who have Hep B. I, I recommend establishing some sort of relationship with those health centers or providers and um, perhaps arranging for some sort of education so that it's really um, something that they think about and when they receive those faxes, it's responded. But sometimes it's not necessarily a provider's lack of care. It maybe depends on how those faxes or requests are received from the administrative end uh, and making sure that that message is actually getting to the provider and not kind of getting um, lumped into like a stack of papers that they may easily um, overlook. So I do think that a lot of the women with Hep B um, are often immigrants and limited English proficient and may be receiving their care more often by certain health centers and providers. And so if you can figure out if there's like a top five list and reach out to those individuals or um, health centers to, to establish, establish like a communication line, then that would be beneficial. So ensuring that administratively they are getting those requests from you um, and also maybe providing an education. Um, and just to follow up on that, uh, Dr. Tang, do you have any advice for uh, perinatal hepatitis B prevention coordinators? So those health department staff, which I believe is in almost all, all US jurisdictions and territories on following up directly with the mom in order to prevent um, transmission or following up after the birth in terms of, you know, kind of um, what I mean is, um, when they're interacting with, say, an, you know, a woman who may be limited English proficient, um, you know, maybe from foreign born, for example. Yeah, well, I mean, I think always make sure you're communicating in the preferred language or otherwise it might go over their heads and the message may not be communicated. But I know there is often a lag in collecting the relevant data that's needed to assess if a mother is high risk or not. And you may not get the data until the mother's already delivered her child. And so I think it is really important if you are able to talk with the patient directly and really engage them in the care. Like it's important, you know, talk to your doctor about making sure you get your viral load checked during pregnancy. And it's typically, you know, at your 28 weeks, typically it's done when they get their um, oral glucose test, when they get their like diabetes screening. But, um, you know, around 28 weeks, make sure that you're getting your virus load checked if you haven't already. So I, because I understand there's always a lag in getting, getting the data that you're supposed to collect, I think you really need to engage the patient up front when you first um, touch base with them to, so that they can proactively make sure that they're getting what they need. And so having things like that Happy Moms Roadmap, like your local jurisdiction probably has something like that so they can have it laid out and in their preferred language what they need to do during pregnancy and after pregnancy and giving that education up front instead of necessarily relying on the providers because you may not reach them in time, they may not give you the data in time for you to intervene if, it, if they had a high-risk pregnancy. Um, and then just the uh, HEPI roadmaps, there's a, a lot of folks that are really interested in getting a copy of that. So we'll be sure to share a link to that um, from the NEMS website. Um, as yeah, part of and also the, the Charles B. Wong um, Charles B. Wong also has one, so we'll we'll share both. Sounds good. And um, well, I I assume they are willing to share it. They have in the past. Um, I see this question here about what are the risks of perinatal transmission with occult HEPI, and that's come up before. And um, I would say that the risk is low, and um, if they get the birth dose, um, that is very likely um, sufficient to prevent 
mother to child transmission. So most women with occult hep B, so that means their service antigen is negative, but they have detectable viral load. Their viral load is typically very low level, like 20, 50, like no more than 100 in most cases, unless they are on immunosuppression. And in that case, they're probably already managed by, um, you know, by a specialist. But most cases, uh, you don't need to worry too much. Like if they're service antigen negative, they don't need to get the HVIG. Um, and even if they have a cold hep B and low-level viremia, the birth dose that is given to their baby should protect them from transmission. Okay, and I think we have time for one last one. Uh, so just a clarification of when exactly hepatitis B or how is it transmitted to a baby during pregnancy in utero or during the birthing and delivery process? It's thought to be during the birthing and delivery process rather than through the placenta. Um, that is the that, that is the current um, belief, and so that is why we focus on getting the anti the virus level down in time for delivery. Um, the, I think there is some data, maybe showing that for C section deliveries, the risk of transmission was actually lower than those who had vaginal deliveries because it's often sometimes more bleeding in some ways between the mom and the baby. But it is not a recommendation that hep B moms get a C-section. Um, so it really has to do with the birthing process going through the canal, and um, which often involves um, blood on both the, the infant and the mother's part. Got it. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and, and it looks like we are at time. Um, so thank you, Dr. Tang, for, for your time and for sharing your expertise with us. Um, this has been incredibly helpful. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We will share a recording of the presentation, like I said, and, a, and uh, many of you have asked for a copy of the presentation slides. So with Dr. Tang's permission, we'll be sure to share those with you, as well as the Hep B Moms roadmaps um, from both of the clinics. If we weren't able to get to your question today, um, please feel free to connect with us and we'll follow up directly as well. Um, you can find our email address and our website there. And if you could also please fill out a brief survey as you leave the session, um, we'd appreciate your feedback on the presentations today and suggestions for additional topics to include in our series in the future. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Tang. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.